how can you be sure that that's something that you might actually want to render? And the first thing, I have to credit Ori for this, is that there may be some spaces where like nobody's checking. We've, we have seen some analogies for this already in the NFT space, thankfully. The NFT folks have tested the waters for some of these things. So we've seen NFT uh, projects that created digital assets off of original IP that they did not own and that resulted in various forms of litigation. You can look it up and see you know, how it fared for them in those experiences because the, the content creator was essentially violating a policy there. And you can read the, the legal reviews of, you know, for some of them and you can see kind of how it was handled. In, in those cases, it is, it is like the, um, what's the term? The, the content creator was, was creating a fraudulent artifact. They were issuing a fraudulent asset, you know, effectively. Um, in the, 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 the process for the world creator is a little bit different because they're creating a world that fraudulent artifacts can either come into or that our fraudulent artifacts are forbidden from. We also have a good analogy for that, um, and it's actually our wonderful customs process in the United States. So if you're importing products into the United States, you have to comply with US customs regulations. And there are classes of product that you might import to the United States where that product is known to have additional requirements, either duties or, or other issues related to it. So if you're importing, importing a bunch of, of wood, and you're, you're going to make beautiful tables in the United States, that wood could come from the Amazon rainforest. And then we might ask for proof of origin documentation for that physical wood before you're going to be allowed to import it. You might also be worried about bugs or beetles or other things in the wood that could cause harm to the domestic wood industry. And so we ask for credentials at the border today for wood uh, of certain categories and other commodities of certain categories. And the credentials give us some kind of confidence. They give US customs some kind of confidence that this is a product that's going to be allowed into this universe. Um, but the, the documentation today is paper, it's digital formats, it's you know, verifiable credentials are just being explored for some of these cases. Um, so I think we've got good analogies for, for pieces of this, but we haven't, you know, we won't really know until we, until we test it. But, but I think there's, the, there's, like, there's good precedent here. And there's two problems here, right? One is how to technically make this possible to respect QG handbag authenticity. The other one is the legal requirement to do so. I'm less interested in the legal requirement to do so. I'm very interested in making sure that technically we have a way to actually do this. But it's a, it's a eventually this turn into a supply chain, you can trace it back further and further. And get Pro provenance is a thing, and supply chain provenance would be a thing here too, right? And, and I'm sure there's some countries that don't care what kind of wood you bring in. Yeah. The difference here, obviously, is that to, to bring in wood, you have to go get the wood and bring it. You can't just like right click save as, yeah. which, which means that it's a much more prevalent problem in the digital world because yeah. of that. I wish you could right click save as wood. I would have saved a lot of money building my house. Yes. So, but it's, it's, a, it's also sort of the consumer's choice problem, right? Because if you build a wood, I want other people to come. If I restrict too hardly, maybe nobody show up. But I think it's not a binary, it doesn't have to be a binary question like that. I think that for a savvy um, world builder, maybe you want to build different uh, iterations or, or different versions of the same world. And, and in one sense, you might have very strict rules. Like maybe you want the you know, uh, under 13 kid version of your world. Um, uh, in another um, uh, world, maybe you want to have you know, more granular rules that where somebody, somebody if you, for instance, have a, a single player environment. Maybe you want them to be able to mod it a little bit and, and do whatever they want. Um, and, and so, I mean, and, and there, there are already examples of this. I mean, we have, you know, uh, World of Warcraft in its modern sense, but then they've also released World of Warcraft Classic, which got very, which became very popular. And a lot of video games have done that, where they release the older version that hasn't had a huge update. Um, and so I think version history, I think version control and version selection when it comes to um, uh, the consumers, where they can kind of decide their own story in terms of how they want to be, uh, which, which layer of this broad layer or this broad world they want to um, immerse themselves in and, and exist in. 
I think that that's where it can it, be, it can become sort of synergistic, and it, and there are can be compromises in that regard. And uh, the the other portion, uh, just one quick example, I think I go back to, would it be like how YouTube uh, evolved in terms of uh, content uh, authenticity of that, you know, which part of a copyright law they can <laughs> respect, right? All those laws are kind of a little fuzzy, and they, they change over time, I'm sure, uh, depending on how the user react to it and how, how they push it. Yeah, and I, I think that statefulness and version, um, version history in that regard is going to be um, incredibly useful because, you know, if you can just say, hey, I mean, and this is what um, a lot, lot, you know, the blockchain community is all about this, it's yeah. all about forks and, you know, deciding which fork you want to be on. Now, the, the forks that are the most populous went out usually, um, but they only went out in the sense of more people use it. It doesn't necessarily win out in, in that you can't use other options. Um, and so I think that um, now, now when it comes to whether or not a company is responsible for a legacy version, that gets into murky waters because they're like, hey, we already moved beyond this. You know, we don't want to support this anymore. But maybe, you know, somebody uh, cloned it or maybe somebody, um, you know, um, took a, a, um, an image of it and now it's being used as with the, um, uh, you know, stamp of this that belongs to this brand, but the brand's like, hey, we, we, we already upgraded from that. So that also, you know, um, is, is a question that is kind of up in the air. Speaking of spatial audio, that was definitely over there. I'm, 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 I'm going to break the system now. Um, so I, I, I want to change the topic uh, to usability, um, or that's the question that I have. So um, with friends and family, I use um, crypto messengers. And not, I'm not the signal kind of person. Um, because I don't like my messenger tied to my phone number. So I found like this wonderful messenger called Session, which uh, does things comparable to how you would set up a crypto wallet. Um, you generate a key that only you have. It's a private key. Does the same thing. You um, package this up in like these 12 words that you type in so you can better remember it. It's a, like a nice way to do it, right? And I'm having trouble with um, explaining to friends what it means to have no account. So I think the answer is to not to. But is that the end of your question? So here's the thing. I tried both ways. I tried to teach them, yes, you don't have to have an account. There's no email address involved. You don't sign up anywhere with your Gmail or your phone number or whatever, right? You just generate this key. And that's it. And please don't lose it. <laughs> right? And if I, if, I, if I explain it like this to them, they will lose the key. If I explain it to them in a way where I say, hey, um, this is similar to an account and a password that you have, right? They either forget it or they think, oh, you know, like this, this private key part thing that appears on my phone that is my identity. I don't really know what that is, so I'm going to show it to all my friends. And you can actually just go on YouTube mm -hmm. and watch how people set up, uh, for instance, crypto wallets. You will, you, what you often see is like they, they set it up, um, and, and the crypto wallet eventually asks them to, to enter a PIN, and they, they blur that out. And on the next screen, you will see the private key, and they they don't blur that out because they fundamentally don't understand that is the important information, not the, not the stupid pin, right? And, and so, 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 so that is, this is like part one of the question is, um, you know, like this inversion that you talked on earlier that now you're sort of like responsible for your identity because it's decentralized. Like how do you, how do you teach an entire generation that was brought up with this idea that you sign up to, 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 to crap um, and they will not get this information back from anyone. Um, that is a, a usability aspect. People, people from, uh, have argued against crypto for specifically that reason, that you, know, like you send your money to the wrong address and it's gone forever. Um, and the other part um, about that uh, system is like how, how, how do you deal with the fact that if you accidentally gave away your identity that 
um, everybody will have access to it, and there's nothing you can do about it at that point. It's like, you know, when you give away your private key, everybody has access to your wallet, and you, you can't regain control over it because it's gone. So there's a couple, uh, there's a couple things there. Um, and I'm going to do the last one first because it's the simplest. The reason why decentralized identifiers are important is because it decouples the key and the identifier. And so if the identifier is you, you can rotate the key that's part of it. And that's a really useful aspect. The rest of it is really similar from, from a key perspective. Like, it's, it's mostly the same. But it, that's an important difference, because if my, if my friends know me by the identifier, now, you can still foul it up. If I leak my private key, someone else can actually rotate that key to something that I don't have control over. So it's possible to do, but it's one little important level of indirection. Most of the rest of your answer comes down to the fact that software today that's designed for crypto wallets and, and other types of, or even you know, encrypted messaging, they still think they're in the adoption part of the curve where only the like super early adopters are actually using it. And so they've developed interfaces for those. And that's a problem because they'll do things like show you your private key, right? And so there's, they're trying to like help you gain confidence in it because they're like doing crypto the right way by even telling you that there's a key involved, for example. But a lot of that is the failing of the software in that it's allowing you to interact with it in that way without, for example, very explicit warnings about the danger of showing everything, the thing that's about to show up on the screen on the next thing because you actually insist on going to see it. And so nothing about what we've talked about is a, is a problem so much with the technology. It's, you identified it correctly. It's a problem with the user experience and people not really understanding like what's really involved and how it's really working. I expect when we, when we have like shipping versions of this and we have early forms of this, I, I think we need to make lots more progress, but like you end up with something that looks like a contact list and, and that's how you're dealing with it. And so, and so like with, with the forms that we've had, no one's ever asked me like, okay, now how do I create an account? Because when they set up the app, you know, they go through a process of like creating a pin for it and there's some sort of basic intro stuff and you feel like you set up an account despite the fact that there was no accounts created anywhere. And so I think that this is entirely because people misunderstand the, the current audience they should be developing for and it's further along the adoption chain, not at that early adopter where, where, where nerds are like, hey cool, like I'm just gonna show the private key here because I wanna check my code to make sure that it's actually doing the right thing. And, and, then, and then they kind of leave it in there because of whatever. And so there's a huge amount of usability that's already happened. There's even more in front of us as we tune the things that kind of happen here. And no one wants like bad UX accidents to happen. They inevitably will because we're gonna not be perfect at this. But as we do, we'll be able to polish these things out to the point where regular people use this uh, on a regular basis. And, and here's an example, right? Um, back when the internet was new, my mother is a Land's End shopper. And the only thing that she, I, I paid for our the second phone line and, and an internet connection to my house, and then I switched to cable modem service and whatever. My mom ended up keeping it when I moved out of the house. But the, ironically, the main thing she used the internet for was that she hated to look at the catalog that Land's End mailed her in the mail, call up the number to order, and something would be out of stock. And so I showed her, I'm like, hey, look, if you look it up on the Land's End website, it'll show if it's in stock or not before you call. And she's like, that's amazing. She would mark up the catalog, she would sit down at the computer and go through and, and, and then look up the stock options, change what she had marked in the catalog, then call and place an order, okay? So the next phase of progress that my mom made was she's like, well, I'm nervous about using my credit card online. And I said, let me teach you about this little lock icon in the browser and what it actually means. And, 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 and I explained to her and she could click on it and she could see it. And I was like, and, and if you do this, it's gonna be safer than giving your credit card to the guy at the pizza place, right? And she understood this, right? And then she would check that lock icon every time she made an online purchase. And one time she called me and said, she said, you'd be so proud of me. I went to one of the regular sites that she used, the certificate was expired. And so it gave her a warning. So she called him on the phone and said, I was gonna order on your website, but it says the certificate has expired, so I'm not going to, you need to fix that, <laughs> right? <laughs> this, is, this is my mother, right? She, she, <laughs> she knows nothing about cryptography. All I had to do was teach her some safe practices because 
browsers and SSL certificates did a pretty good job of a user experience early on indicating what was safe. And I'm air quoting that because we all know of all the other problems besides certificate authentic authenticity that, that can cause this to happen. But my point is, is that if my mother can learn which sites are safe and which sites are not, then I'm sure that we can produce a user experience where it does not involve her revealing her private key. I would also say that for anything that's high security enough, you should always be using threshold cryptography so that sort of any one device being compromised or lost or stolen doesn't result in a compromise of your private key. So to build on that, one of the things about losing your key is like a big freaking deal, right? If you ever lose your key, it's a problem. Uh, one thing that we've talked about a lot in our community but have not yet executed on, but I'm excited to, is the concept of social recovery, right? Oh, we got five minutes left. We just barely got started. So um, if it's content re your social recovery, it's ridiculous that we are not exploiting personal relationships to make it easy for people to recover from, from yeah. lost crypto keys. Um, and or identity keys or whatever, but keys in general. And the ability to say, to call up my friends and family, you know, five or seven or nine or whatever of them and say, hey, listen, can I use you as someone for key recovery? And what happens is, is you shard the information that's needed to actually recover your accounts. And it's not always your private key. It might be a private key that's used for rotation. So that the, the real private key might be locked to your hardware device or something, but you, you've pre-set up a, a key that can be used for rotation. You shard that and you spread it out, Shamir, N of M of N type of scenarios. And then what happens is, is let's say I have seven, I gotta go convince five of those personal contacts that it's really me. That's probably pretty good because it might be like my mother, right? I hope she can identify me positively and not an imposter, et cetera. My, like my wife, maybe one of my kids. And then, I go to the social contacts, they're also likely to help me in a hurry because like it's a personal relationship. I can then regain the private keys for rotation. I can then rotate the relevant keys to something that I again control and now I have a really good scenario here where if I drop my phone in the ocean, I know who, five of the people that I can actually begin the process with and the software can help me make sure that I can sort of collect authorization from the five and the shards. Now I can recover this in a way that didn't need, I didn't need to know anything about remembering 12 words. I didn't need to have something in a safe deposit box. And I also didn't have to know anything about cryptography. And, and th those types of user experiences for recovery are really powerful. And those are the types of things that we need to have solved to allow regular people to manage keys even though they have no idea that a key is involved. Right. Yeah, I, I mean, like, I'm, I'm not so much concerned about the security aspect of things. It's just that, um, uh, you know, like growing up in the 90s with the internet, uh, it was completely normal that you just go on IRC and claim your ex. That, that, that's how it worked. There, there, there were no accounts. And uh, we had a big shift since then where, where people think, okay, you have to have an email address and a password to everything. And, and for me, it's like how to best, you know, not, not what technology to develop or how to make it secure, but how to teach people you know, to, to go beyond that. Because fundamentally, I bump into a lot of people who just can't deal with this concept. Like, Mentally. <laughs> so there's, uh, uh, what you said about education is like 100% correct. I think there's education we do with our family members, you know, teaching them how to use technology safely. There's education we're required to complete before we can interact in the world, like you're required to pass, you know, tests to drive a vehicle, you know, on public transportation because you could cause serious harm if you didn't understand basically how to operate that. And I think in the context of managing identity and relationships, people haven't realized that there's this not maybe not like a car accident, like killing people kind of harm that comes from mismanaging keys and identity. But there are really serious consequences, financial loss consequences, information warfare, manipulation, harassment consequences that come from mismanaging information about friends in our social network or ourselves. And I think we're all responsible for teaching each other that the world has changed. You know, COVID happened and we all had to adopt to a new reality and a new set of protocols for interacting with people that suddenly we were forced to sort of take this physical contact thing a little bit differently. 
And for some of these identity scenarios with cryptocurrency, you know, if you're going to really take control over your digital assets, along with that will come some education you're gonna have to. I think though, when we talk about credentials, there's precedent here. For example, people know that if you lose your car keys, someone can drive away with your car. So we have really good analogs there. If you lose your wallet, you have to revoke your credit card. They don't use that word, but that's what they're doing. They, you know, they have to, um, the driver's license, they basically just replace it because you hope that the biometric of a picture on it is, is, is useful and that may or may not be true. But they already know that you have to go through these sort of recovery things to actually get stuff back. And if we, part of the problem about communication is that we, don't, we never had secure communication in the analog world. And so to teach them about secure communication, you're actually teaching them kind of about communication in a raw way. When we actually transition the keys, like the physical keys that we have, and the credentials that we have in our wallet, I think there's a little bit better of an analogy, and I think that people understand the importance of that a little bit better. Now, most people don't know that if you let someone take a picture of your keys, they can replicate every single one of those physical keys. But if you explain it to them real quick, they'll be like, oh yeah, crap, I'm not gonna do that anymore, right? And most people, do, it's not like a social thing we do. There's probably some TikTok memes that's gonna show up where people start holding their keys and taking a picture, but, right? And like, it's a thing, everyone show me your key. So, um, but like, I think we already have pretty good awareness about the credentials and the keys in our life. And so as we teach them, okay, this is a way to do this electronically, then that's like, a good analogy for the importance that they should pay this. So I do agree with you. I have to say that there's two levels of responsibility and it's not just education. We also have to make sure as the developers of software that help people do this, that we don't make garbage software. <laughs> and then we need to teach them how to use it, right? Like if we have software, we're like, okay, now dance carefully over these razor blades. We've done a, we've done a bad job, right? Like, or never hit that button. And if they hit that button, they're hosed. So you have, to, you have to develop software that has the appropriate amount of, of education built in and, and then train people how to do that. Yeah, I was going to add to what Tova was saying, and I, I do think there's a gap when like the social education, like, you know, I grew up in the 80s and we got like so many PSAs, like don't leave burning stuff around, don't get into cars with strangers, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I don't know if kids are still getting those PSAs, but they're not getting the ones they need. Like, do not send naked pictures of yourself to anyone, you know, uh, <laughs> like, like SS44 is not your friend on YouTube. Leave that stuff alone, whatever. Like there's a whole bunch, like we've, like they could be less hokey. And, but the problem is, is a lot of, you know, kids are very digitally savvy and their parents are like, oh, I guess they're just on the internet, like as if it's all one thing. And so maybe it is on us as developers and people who are kind of inviting folks into the space to be like, hey, we made some PSAs, which are the ones you actually need for your digital life because we're providing the tools and you're not getting that at home, unfortunately. Good point. And as an as a, as, as a indication of how much this has shifted, we used to be taught don't meet, meet people from the internet and don't get in strangers' cars. Now we literally summon strangers from the internet and get in their car. Yeah. Right? <laughs> like, that's how I got here from the airport. Right? So, like, it's totally changed, and we need to make sure that we're teaching the people around us sort of these obvious public service announcements. Yeah. So just one other thought. Like, uh, we're within or past the one minute mark, but most, yes. Most people here probably are used to using a knife to cut up their food to eat, you know, your food. And at some point when you were younger, your parents said, don't run around with the knife, like, you know, because you might fall and you might stab yourself with it. Don't run with scissors. If you, if you grew up in a family where hunting was prevalent, you might be received firearms training at an early age for how to safely operate a firearm. Now there are firearms that are very, very hard to safely operate, and then there are firearms that are very easy to safely operate. There are safety mechanisms for firearms that require biometric locks, but then if I'm injured, I can't hand that firearm to my you know, spouse to defend me in a home security situation, but, you know, unless we're both locked, right? And there's all kinds of other issues that come when you start to design into your security system these mitigation strategies. So when you say don't dance over razor blades, that's correct. Like that does, there's not a lot of value in dancing over razor blades, but there could be value in I'm burning this private key right now and I don't wanna to have to sit in a long process waiting for it because I'm you know, an advanced user who's received firearms training and you know, I know what a private key is and I know when I want it to not be there anymore. 
For like, sure. There are scenarios where you're, you know, maybe an experienced operator wanting for some of these advanced capabilities, and a lot of this software was built for those people first, like you said. I would be cautious to say that we should just mute it all the way down to, you know, a butter knife solution for everyone, because I think there are a lot of cases where you still need to be able to really cause serious harm to yourself with, you know, a technology because you know how to operate that safely and you want to have the ability to use that technology without limitations placed around it. But I think it's, it, it, you have to be very careful when you're designing systems like that because it, it, who is the end consumer for this technology? There are firearms out there that are not appropriate for the average consumer in a hunting scenario, like at all. <laughs> And you know, if you're selling them to the average consumer in a hunting scenario, you're just waiting for something unfortunate to happen. And the cryptocurrency wallet space, that's unfortunately what has happened. So in my slicer for my 3D printer, I use Prusa Slicer, there's like a simple like intermediate and advanced modes you can put the software in. And when you get advanced, you have 4,000 knobs that you can turn to tune every conceivable aspect of slicing, right? That's like terrifying for a new user. When you're in the simple mode, you get like four. And I really like that analogy. And I think that might be a good solution for what you've got in the sense that you, when you first install it, you're in simple mode. And you're allowed to dial up the level of both customizability and risk that you're willing to take to make sure that you have those options. And, and, and that's true. In the software that we've got, you, you can't see dids or keys unless you really try. And we let you really try. I've often wondered, you know, we have captchas for things to make sure you're human. I've often wanted to implement a system where before you took an action, you had to solve a Sudoku puzzle. Get this. <laughs> because, because it makes you really want to, to have to sit there for a couple minutes and actually do all the math to solve the Sudoku puzzle. And I don't know if that's the answer or not, probably not. But, but that's the kind of level that we actually need to think about in our software design. We're out of time. Thanks, everyone. This was a super great conversation. Um, I'm Telegram Sam on all the socials, and I'm Sam at Indicio.tech. If you have questions or you want to like, continue a conversation, please reach out, and I hope I see you all in other venues or here again or something sometime. Thanks all.